Hi everyone. Let's talk about graphic narratives. In this lecture, we're going to examine the phenomenon in the 1950s known as the anti-comic crusade. Really, it's crusades. There were many all over the globe that singled out comics as a terrible influence on youth and needed to be reformed. These anti-comics crusades were not the only thing that caused the collapse of the comics industry, but they were certainly an important influence on what prevented it from ever returning to anything like it was before. The 1950s saw a significant change in the genres that were popular as comic reading audiences matured, as we talked about in the last lecture, you could see that the superhero genre, which had been the mainstay of early comic books, began to fade, and horror and true crime began to take off. Also, Adventure and Jungle, which had been such a major part of the early comics, faded, and we had romance comics, which surged briefly and then eventually began to fade. Also, we saw a resurgence of westerns during this time, and toward the end, funny animals, which had faded, turned with force. What was causing a lot of these changes? was, as I said, the way in which the readers wanted more challenging, complex narratives and adult audiences were reading them now. Soldiers who had returned from the war had picked up a habit of reading comics and continued to look to them for entertainment. One of the things that's really important to remember about this change was that there was a massive amount of comics that were published shortly after the war years. All of the restrictions on paper and ink had fallen away, and there was a huge flood of people getting into the business, publishing a lot more comics than there really were an audience for. Furthermore, most comics were pulped. People didn't collect comics. They were meant to be spontaneous or instantaneous entertainment, and then they were meant to be cast aside. If they weren't sold, they were sent back to the publisher and they would be pulped again. So only those comics that were sold and collected survived. Now, over time, the market for comics changes and people begin collecting comics more and more. That is why, even though far fewer comics are published, far more of them are in the market today. So, one of the things that began early in the 1950s and late 1940s was Christian groups and youth groups began attacking the amorality of comics. They rejected the stories, the garish uh, action. All of this was meant to promote lewd behavior. And they even had these comic book burnings where adults organized kids to go and round up whatever comics they could find and have a big party with a giant bonfire. What really led to the legitimization of this movement was Frederick Wortham, who was a psychologist who had done research in the poor of Harlem in New York City. He was a Democrat. He was not a religious leader. And he was beating the drum, demanding that action be taken about these horrible comics that were corrupting our youth. Now, why Frederick Wortham leveled his sights on comics is still a bit of a mystery. Evidence has come out that he falsified his research, exaggerating the claim that comics were 
to blame for so many of society's ills, and that many other factors, including poverty and lack of social services to the poor, were a much higher influence on juvenile delinquency. But comics were an easy target. They were a young industry. They didn't have the cachet of other major markets like movies. One of the things that they had no regulation at all. So there was no governing body to look over the character of the content. During this time, there were a number of sensational stories that pointed to the possibility that crimes were motivated by actions people saw in comics. Thus, that there was a 1954 Senate subcommittee hearings on juvenile delinquency that was very sensational, and publisher William Gaines was hauled before the Senate committee, and he made a spirited defense for the comics he created, but in the public opinion, he failed to sway many people, and most people were, frankly, shocked by what they saw. This meant the industry itself needed to regulate how comics were made, and an attempt to dissuade the government from taking any action on comics, they established the Comics Code Authority, which was an association of comics magazine publishers, ACMP, and that all of the publishers who made comics would have to get the stamp of approval for their pages before they were allowed to be published and distributed. There were very few distributors of comics, and so it was important to get this stamp if you wanted your comics to appear in the newsstands or any place where anyone could buy them. The Comics Code of Authority established a number of rules. First of all, it said that in every instance, good shall triumph over evil, and criminal pun- the criminal punished for his misdeeds. So there could not be any scenes where the criminal got off scot-free. Scenes of excessive violence shall be prohibited. Scenes of brutal torture, excessive and unnecessary knife and gunplay, physical agony, gory and gruesome crime shall be eliminated. So this would cut out all true crime comics. Furthermore, the treatment of love romance stories shall emphasize the value of home and the sanctity of marriage. And so these kinds of strictures were clearly intended to eliminate all of the adult-leaning content in comics at that time and firmly and absolutely establish that comics were made for children, period. Some more adult-themed comics continued to be published, but they had to adopt very strict rules of dress codes and appearances. We see in this pre-comics code a picture that would be acceptable is now edited where she's wearing a longer dress and the bed has now been tucked in and the language has been cleaned up. There were a lot of arguments that comics promoted homosexuality and the idea of the sidekick was suddenly thrown into a harsh light. One of the changes that happened to Archie Comics was the subduing of the sexual characteristics of its main characters. You'll notice that if you look at the early illustration by Bob Montana, you look at the very famous Dan DiCarlo, who really brought Archie into great fame, you'll notice that the shape of the figures is now more subdued. They still have the large eyes, but notice how Betty is in black, where the shape of her body is no longer accentuated. While these were difficult times for adult-themed comics, one artist rose to prominence in the world of kids' comics. Carl Barks was an animator at Disney Animation, 
And he was a little frustrated at how everything he did was constantly scrutinized by the boss. He asked to be moved to the new comic book division, where he was given complete free reign to draw and to create stories of Donald Duck and his nephews. He invented all the characters that populate Ducksburg, including Uncle Scrooge and many other famous characters. He became especially popular in Nordic countries, where he became known as the Good Duck Artist because his name never appeared in anything he created. Eventually, some of his founds tracked him down and began to send him fan mail. Despite his extraordinary fame and the popularity of the comics that he made, he always received a pittance for each page that he created. He never earned any royalties or any of the residuals for all the properties and intellectual ideas that he generated for Disney. If we look at his work, you can really see a wonderful use of expression and composition that is just really a joy to read. Donald is a very failing character. He's not idealistic. He's very opportunistic. And he's always getting into trouble because he doesn't quite know how to handle himself. And this is what makes him an especially fun character under Carl Barks. Carl Barks was really innovative in a lot of ways. He realized that stories didn't need to make sense, that they, as long as they had a kind of internal logic. He would write later, I would say the key was you have to have a reason for something. If you could find a reason for something, you could drag anything in. And so the reason was the previous panel. It didn't require any more logic than that. If there was some kind of action that was happening, he could find some way to make it crazier and crazier than you ever imagined. Because of this, there's very little consistency in his characters or the world that he created. Everything was made to shape around each individual story. Dell, for a while, tried to stave off its destruction with comics directly keyed into TV shows. TV had become a major distraction for comic readers. In the 1950, there were 3,880,000 or TV sets or 9% of the Americans who own television sets. But by 1959, before the end of the decade, 85.9% Americans owned television sets. This was a massive shift in how entertainment was being doled out. The other big disastrous news for the comic book industry was the collapse of comic book distribution. American News Company, which really had a monopoly on the entire distribution of all news and comics to newsstands throughout the country, was suddenly under investigation for its business practices by the federal government. Overnight, they stopped the distribution of all their magazines and comics. This left small publishers in the lurch, and only larger publishers had the wherewithal and resources to get their published comics to market. Frederick Wortham's argument resonated across the globe, and many countries followed suit and began to ban comics. In Canada, American crime comics were banned from 1940 to 1951. France used the occasion to ban American comics to remove the threat of imperialist American comics and promote French culture. So French comics were allowed to continue. Great Britain also passed the Harmful Publications Act in 1968. 
These are just a few of the dozens of countries all over the globe that took action in restricting how comics were sold and drawn and what they could represent. In America, the Comics Code was a hodgepodge mixed bag of really ill-conceived ideas. War comics were never considered against the Comics Code, even though they represented violence and torture and all sorts of horrific things that no other comic could contain, because it was war, and that's just the way war is. There was also rules against vampires and wolfmen, and one way they got around that was the editor of Marvel had their scriptwriter Marv Wolfman tell the story as a wolfman, and then they gave him credit in, in the comic pages in 1968. What was interesting was that two things happened. Eventually, they began to allow vampires and, and even then wolfmen to appear in comics, but also the artists began to get more credit for their work on the comic pages. 